You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 79, season four kickoff with Dennis Tarnow and Frank Spear. Well, it just doesn't get any bigger than this. Two of our heroes live on The Dental Guys to kick off season four, Dennis Tarnow and Frank Spear live from the Spear Summit 2018. There's just no way we can put into words how big this interview was. You're gonna learn a lot, just like we did, and we're gonna bring it back to the personal side with Geek's Corner as we set you off for an exciting season four that's gonna take things to the next level on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by The Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, The Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Nashville in 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com now to sign up. That's RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. Season 4 is here, and I can't think of a better way than to start Season 4 with, one, a Geek's Corner, okay? Right. Number Classic. two, number two is one of the greatest interviews that we have ever done on this show. At Spear Summit 2018, we saw when they invited us out there to cover this, we saw that they were going to have Dennis Tarnow and Stephen Chu as um, presenters. And we asked <laughs> because right. why wouldn't we ask if we could have them on the show to talk shop and you guys know that we love these guys we practice what they preach we practice mm -hmm. dual zone technique during our um during our in our practice we also teach dual zone at uh, restorative driven implants and yep. you know it wasn't as smooth once we got to the interview which you'll hear in this episode it wasn't as smooth getting them actually to be interviewed or be on the show. John, what in the world happened well, out there, man? Yeah, it was crazy because the night before everything's confirmed, the morning of, we had a time to meet and get everything rolling early in the morning. And and uh, we had a great uh, contact there at Spear, Jen, who was kind mm. of responsible for getting everybody to the right place at the right time. And she said, you know, she met him down where they were supposed to be. Well, she was there. They weren't there. And she looked all over that place trying to find them walked miles and couldn't find them anywhere. They were supposed to be here. They're supposed to be there. So finally turned out what they were doing is they were in the auditorium, you know, working on their presentation because you know, even these guys, these guys practice in the same practice. They travel so much lecturing around the world that mm. they rarely get time to just hang out and work on their stuff. So they're fine tuning it down to the last moment. So then we thought, man, it's not going to happen. Like, right. we're not going to get this interview. We were kind of disappointed. Well, at and, that point, you know, too, it was past the time where we would even be able to interview them. Yeah, we thought, well, that's it for the day. You know, that was our time. So then, who comes to the rescue but Frank Spear? And he says, hey, guys. He says, we're going to make this happen. And he literally walks over. Stephen, the doc, Dr. Chu, had to, he had to fly out uh, earlier, right after the lecture, but uh, Dr. Tarnow was staying around. So, so Frank walks over to him and I, we see him talking and he just kind of talks to him and sort of just says, Hey, come on over. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, when Frank Spear asks you to do an interview, you know, you probably say yes to that. And, you know, we realized that with Dr. Tarnow, that part of what was uh, maybe a challenge for him coming over to us was we didn't you know, a lot of people want, a lot of people want a piece of him. You know, he's a big name. And people sometimes are maybe trying to use that name to, you know, get something or gain yeah. notoriety. And we just wanted to talk to the guy, but he didn't know who we were. He probably thought we were going to ask Monetize for his secrets or something. In some way right. Or, you know, so knows? he comes over and he's a little skeptical, Wes, wasn't he? I mean, he oh, was yeah. like, he's like, so what's this going to be about? Until we started, we, you know, we were very like, we rolled in very quiet. I mean, we both, we were holding our, 
you know, our, our script sheet. We had actually produced the show we and sent them ahead of time what we'd be talking about. And so we just kind of just kind of went off that script. We say, Dr. Tarnow, we appreciate you coming over here to be able to talk to us. We just want to talk about these things. And he was like, you guys want to talk about that? He was like, okay, we can right. talk about that. And you just saw him start to open up just yeah. right there. And he said, okay, well, let's do this. So yep. he walks around, Frank comes on, and and we really appreciate Dr. Spear doing that for us and making Dr. Tarnow feel comfortable with us. And yeah, it made us, it gave us legitimacy, I think, to to yeah. to Dennis because he realized, okay, if, if Frank's wanting me to do this, Frank's cool with these guys. I'm cool with these guys. It was, and, it was and, awesome. And as the interview started, it started off a, a little maybe, I don't know, the word is sort of stiff. Like we were, yep. we were all kind of trying to, he was trying to fill us out a little bit. We were trying to make him feel comfortable. Um, and then it was like, once we started asking some of these questions, he just, you could just watch his, him kind of open if up you, like, wow, these guys do care about this. And watch the YouTube version of this. And let me just make this announcement, guys. <laughs> let me just make this announcement. Because yeah. if, if you want from here on out, from here on out, to get mm -hmm. a leg up on the dental guys and hear and watch the dental guys, we are going to start releasing the YouTube version of this podcast the night before the audio right. version gets released, okay? And this is one of the reasons why, because the the video of Dr. Tarnow... Yeah. When, when we started getting into it, Wes, I mean, tell, tell us how, like, you started so, to see this interesting so, change. So what you saw was, is you saw a guy go into a certain mode of mm -hmm. teaching, and literally he was closing his eyes, talking into the microphone. Like, you could yep. see him looking, like, at one point during this interview, he's talking about the difference between scanning electron micrographs and light microscopes when analyzing the bone to implant interface and you can see him closing eyes and guess what he's doing is he's actually looking at the slides in his brains and he's explaining mm -hmm. to you what he's seeing it yeah. was a treat yeah. and you can actually see frank spear too is just like tell me more yeah. i want to know more he's just and John smiling and, just and just kind of like smiling. watching this yes. man at work he's the watching intonations like the, all that and yeah. so that's what you get Whenever you right, watch with the, the dental guys on video. And so from here on yeah. out, season four, we started it out. What we're yep. going to do is we're going to start releasing the YouTube version of the dental guys. You can head us over there right now. We have a, we have, you know, a small subscriber count there. and um, But we want you guys to subscribe to the dental guys on YouTube. And, you right. know, with YouTube now... What you can do is if you want to listen to YouTube in your car, you can listen to the audio version only, but that's not the point. The point is to check the video out and right. put this up on the big screen in your home. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, let's just be honest. We look good, Wes. Oh, man. Look at this People studio. Well, see, let me just tell I mean, you. This right here. This face that, right there, that you're looking that at guy. right here, this guy. <laughs> Yeah, what's, what's but what behind we're, but what we're the dental bring guys that matter? Is... It's what's behind the dental guys that matter. That's right. A picture That's exactly right. of a six and one team right now. Oh <laughs> no! Here I we don't go. know what we're going to do. Here we right go. Now. You know, West Virginia, the Mountaineer <sighs> Stadium, right there. I'm pointing to it. See if you're watching the YouTube, you can actually see it. Actually, you can see the dental school from here. If you look. Uh, right over there Ash, is Virginia. where I went to dental school. <laughs> Mount, Mama. And then, yeah, and, but, and back know, behind me, yes. you have what you really care about, which is <laughs> the Millennium Falcon. Oh my! And a handmade oh. by a patient, handmade welded Tie Fighter. So it's I mean, what's cooler? Hashtag or a Tie Fighter. Next and the level. hashtag, which is currently not lit, it should be lit. Right. That it right should there. be lit. Not but you know, know, if you if you tune in, you're going to get the scoop. You, you get it a day earlier. You can amaze your friends with already having heard the show before it releases on audio. Now, we know a lot of you are still going to listen to audio because you're going to be mowing your lawn. I mean, that's fine. Right, that's we fine. don't want you mowing your lawn watching YouTube. That is, you know, We're right. not responsible for any lawn mowing accidents hey. resulting from you watching YouTube but while you, on your zero turn. So just, you know. Hey, but listen, it's a great you, way you can, to watch the dental guys. Yeah, it's a and, great and if way. you saw, if you could watch, if you watch this interview with Tarnow, you're going to see that light bulb come on, those moments where... 
he realizes that, you know, this is, well, you see the passion, you see the knowledge. One of the comments Wes made as we were kind of reviewing this show is he said, you know, you, you might, just when you think you might know a little more or you might have a good question for Dr. Trinauer, you might stump him like he, he always knows more than you. And, it, and that's not in a, not, he's a humble, he's actually a very humble guy. Very, he very just, humble. He, that was the thing we were really struck by because he's such a smart guy and a lot of people think, He's, you know, he's kind of a fast talk in New York, classic New Yorker, right? Mm-hmm. But, but he's completely humble. Um, he, he wants to teach. That's his thing. You see that come through. He wants That's to it. teach. He wants people to comprehend and understand. And he's so passionate. I mean, his discussion about implant design is just another level. It's awesome. You know, which, which you just don't see very often. So it's a real treat to get to number one kick off season four. Season four is kicked two off of our, right Two way. of our heroes, Frank Spear and Dennis Tarnow. And to be able to spend that time with them, to be able to announce our new YouTube release. Mm-hmm. And we think that, you know, we want, we want you to stay tuned today for two things. One is going to be Geek's Corner, where we're going to talk about a really interesting article that just released uh, in Jomi talking about the differences in how sinus lifts with sinus bumps, whether you place graft material or not, does it make a difference? That's a pretty big study. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then also for our reaction to the interview, some of the things that we took away from the time with Dennis Tarnow West. So this is just really, it's it's an exciting way to kick off season four. I'm not? excited, John. Yeah. So so, at, so it's coming to you here in just a minute. Dennis Tarnow and Frank Spear. This is Justin Goodbrand, and here is today's tip. Now is the time of the year for you to assess your business retirement plan. If you have a SEP, a SIMPLE, or a 401k, maybe a different plan or additions of provisions will help maximize your tax reduction strategies for the current year. You must have the amendments in place typically by the end of the year for these to be effective. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak to a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor. Visit heritageinvestor.com or financiallysimple.com for additional information. And welcome to this uh, show of the Dental Guys. Um, And it's wonderful to be a part of Spear Summit this year and have such great clinicians um, like Dennis Tarnow with us today and also uh, Dr. Frank Spear as well. Just a little bit about Dr. Tarnow. Um, he is one of our heroes, John. Yeah, and, that's true. And he's a clinical professor of uh, periodontology and director of implant education at Columbia School of Dental Medicine. And he's previously served as a professor and chairman of the Department of Periodontology and Implant Dentistry at New York University's College of Dentistry where a wing is named after him. Dr. Tarnow, thank you so much for coming on and thank speaking you. to us today about some of these high-level topics and how we can make dentistry better for, uh, for everyone. So, yeah, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you, Frank, for having me. Yeah, Absolutely. It's my, our pleasure. I didn't know you had a wing named after you. Yeah, I do. (laughs) (laughs) When you grow up, Frank, you might have something to aspire to. I have something to aspire to now. (laughs) Well, uh, you know your 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 lecture from from yesterday. You know, you 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 said uh, you used the words you know one surgery one time, and Mm -hmm. it kind of uh, alluded back to the. The, the discussion a few years ago, especially about one abutment one time, you know, and that was uh, one of the ideas that came out. And that, and that idea of one abutment one time pretty much has been debunked. Is that true? I mean, is that that's not I as important? Say that's debi- no, it's not unimportant. Okay. The problem is one abutment one time came about with uh, Salamer and Garber. They talked about putting an abutment on, leaving it there if you can, getting the, the tissue to attach to it, and never change it. Now, that makes a lot of sense if you don't have to change it, you know exactly what kind of abutment you want to use. So Marco Digiti did that, and so, and so did Salama. The problem is that we often put, or the person doing the surgery isn't always the person knowing what prosthetics is going to be done mm-hmm. by the restorative dentist. And so they put on a standard healing abutment, which is what 99% of people will put on. So they don't know the surgeon, oral surgeon, when I say surgeon, I'm using it, periodontist, oral surgeon, whoever's doing the surgery to, to do the implant. They don't always know what the restoration is going to look like. 
they were just putting the surgery on. They're just putting the implant in. So what happens is they don't know what to do, what to put on. So they put on a standard healing abutment, and that has to be ta changed. As I mentioned yesterday, that has to be obviously unscrewed in order to put on your impression copings <coughs> and make your own abutment or custom abutment or whatever. So it gets ripped, and that's what that bleeding is that we spoke about mm -hmm, yesterday. When mm -hmm. we take off that healing abutment from any company, we see bleeding. If it's healthy, we see bleeding. Healthy on the outside, but in the inside, the epithelium has adhered to it, and then we literally are ripping it as we unscrew it. And when we do that, the bleeding has ripped off the junctional epithelium, and it's now down to your connective tissue. Because mm -hmm. as we mentioned yesterday, epithelium doesn't have any blood vessels of its own, and it's, you're into your connective tissue whenever you see bleeding. Yes. Mm. So that's the, it's not been debunked. It would be ideal. Right. To be able to do that. But clinically, it's not practical. And it's a minimal amount of change, correct? If you do disconnect, I remember if that. If you leave it to mature. And that's why you mm. saw Steve and I yesterday, Decker two, and I mentioned yesterday, we let the tissue, the bone itself might be healed within two months from our immediate placement, certainly by three. We're letting the tissue heal as much as four months, three minimum, but usually four months because we want that tissue to heal at a more coronal position and let the connective tissue mature so when we do rip it, when we take off the abutment or the temporary, mm -hmm. it can withstand that, that and it doesn't shrink much or hardly at all. And that's what we've seen. Well, that so, kind of goes into the next thing then, John, because if we still want to try to minimize uh, the amount of disconnects mm -hmm. and let things heal a little bit longer, really I think it goes into what we're doing with uh, dual zone t technique. We're right. doing less and creating more predictable outcomes. Yeah, let's introduce that to for those of that may not know about dual zone. Um, mm -hmm. If uh, it's a it's a concept that that Wes and I have definitely jumped into for for years now. That's become kind of the way we do things. But let's talk. Can you just well, uh, give us that, that. that yeah that clear you know the, give us maybe the the concept from uh, you know as a summary. So for those who might sure. not be familiar. Well, you know, I was doing a case where I was putting an immediate implant in many years ago. It was about eight or nine years ago. And I placed the implant, and I had I filled up the bone in the gap to the crest. And I had some extra bone. So I said, you know, I have this extra bone. Uh, I said, I'm just going to throw it out. Well, see what happens if I just fill it up to the top of the tissue. And I knew it would, part of it would be exfoliated, part of it wouldn't. And I, I have that healing, and I watched it. And I, then when we opened it up, and, and we not opened up, we put a healing button on, and then when we squeezed the tissue out, I saw the particles inside the free gingiva. And I didn't show this yesterday, but I showed this when I do a longer you know, version of yesterday. And I actually showed the particles when we, when we put the pressure on the temporary and squeezed it out. I actually saw in the free gingiva some of the particles of the bone were still there, innocuous, but they thick. Mm. And it got a beautiful result. I said, what if we do that routinely? And that's what started me off on it. And how about if we thicken the tissue that way instead of putting a connective tissue graft in? Mm -hmm. And what we've shown is that we get about eight tenths of a millimeter extra thickness, as we showed yesterday, versus nothing at all. And that's a lot since the tissue is so thin to begin with. You know, if we go from, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Two point, you know, two point two to three point. Uh, I'm sorry, two point four to three point uh, to three point two. It's about eight tenths of a millimeter. It's about thirty percent increase in thickness by putting the bone graft in, and that yeah. to us, simple. It's easy to do, and uh, we, people can do it routinely when they place the implant. Yeah, and then and you found temporary. as we followed along with that, as you started looking at the effect of the provisional versus mm -hmm. just the graft versus a traditional healing abutment. Right. I remember when you had presented that, uh, you know, 0.0, .0 millimeters <laughs> changed if you right. had a provisional as well as the graft and using the provisional as graft containment. Totally. The, Paul Weigel did this work in Germany years ago. He called it, you know, prosthetic socket seal. And so we like that term. It's a good term, prosthetically socket sealing the area instead of using a connective tissue graft over it or anything. Just the temporary holds the tissue in its place, position-wise. Remember, tissue can't grow where something's in its way. It's called contact inhibition. So you can't grow where something's physically in your way. The tissue can't grow. So that's the whole concept of just maintaining the space. And the, uh, and the temporary seals off the opening from any cells leaked out. You get your initial clot in 10 minutes. And then, you know, if the patient doesn't disturb it, with the temporary there, or a custom healing abutment at least, it basically stays that way and the shape is maintained. Now essentially, it's really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. We've, we've kind of jumped and went where the two sat and the implants in and we're grafting, but I'd like to kind of come back to mm -hmm. your extraction technique mm -hmm. because both John and I teach that. Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. believe Great. in it. We believe in atraumatic. Now, there's no, we, we know that every extraction is a traumatic <laughs> event, right. like you've said. For the doctor and the patient. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes more for the doctor. But we also know that you, you've had 
well, we've heard you have specialists raise their hand and say, I will never raise a flap <laughs> right, to take right, out a tooth right. and speak to that and why we are changing. Why would we do that? Why would we not lay a flap to extract a tooth today? Thanks. To me, that's my worldwide push right now. Literally, everywhere I go around the world and lecture, I am trying to emphasize this. And it's amazing how many people still open flaps to take routine teeth out. Mm. The first thing they do is anesthetize the patient, hopefully. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and the second thing they do is take a periosteal elevator and open the free gingiva up around the tooth. Even if they don't make a whole flap, they're opening the buccal crest, exposing it. Mm. And to me, all that, we, instead of using a scalpel, just to sever the gingival fibers and right through. Leave that tissue alone. Do not disturb it. And it's so important because of blood supply, as I mentioned yesterday. If you take out a tooth, you get away, the ligament is gone. And the ligament is a major source of blood supply. 20% by volume of a ligament is probably blood vessels. People don't think of it that way. They think of it as only as fibrous tissue. But it's filled with blood vessels. That's why occlusion can be maintained by our body. Mm. You know, adapt, bone can adapt uh, to occlusion. Number two, so you got to weigh the ligament. The number, and the second one that you, that's really hardly existent is the marrow, because I told you it's so thin, the buccal plate's mm -hmm. so thin. Mm -hmm. There's no marrow, it's all cortical, as we all know. It's under, under a millimeter and most over half a millimeter of thickness. Two thirds of the buccal plates on the six anterior teeth are only a half a millimeter thick. Um, so we have that problem. And then if you open a flap, you have temporarily taken away the last major blood supply, the periosteum. Mm. And people say, well, I sutured it back, so there's no problem. <laughs> you know, you sutured it back. And that's why I was joking around yesterday, are you with a microscope or anything? It doesn't matter if you suture with a microscope or loops. The point is that you've separated the blood supply and then you're putting it back. And it takes four to five days for that re to re anastomose. <laughs> and during that time, that only the marrow is there and it's really non-existent. Yeah. And so that's why we see such change. Now, I didn't show the data yesterday, but the average amount of, uh, like Lekovic and Kenny and others have shown, that the average amount of opening a flap on the six anterior human teeth, it's not an animal study, six anterior teeth, you open a flap and just suture it back. Just mark, the, mark the crest, mark, mark your number, suture it back and follow, and do primary coverage without a membrane. For, after six months, you open it up and you've lost four millimeters buccal-lingually mm -hmm. of the buccal-lingual dimension. That's wow. dramatic. That's dramatic. Like Vic and Kenny did it twice in the late 1997, 98. Mm. And so without a membrane, you wind up just opening and pushing it back. You wind up losing four millimeters. Now, I, I would never do it in an immediate extraction socket if I knew that I was going to lose four millimeters of buckling with a mention. Never. Right. Wouldn't even think about it. Wow. Obviously, we do it in stages and build it up. But there's no question that we are now, and it wasn't until recently, believe it or not, the first one I could find was Uli Grunder in 2011, so what is that, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. That was the first person to show that he put an implant in towards the palate and measured the distance, uh, buccal lingual dimension uh, from the implant to the buccal tissue and showed he only lost one millimeter, mm. no flap. Mm. Mm. So the no flap discussion, here we are in the year 2018 and the extractions have been done since the beginning of time. And if I ask how many clinicians in the audience yesterday or any group, how many, how many millimeters of bone ta change takes place when you take out a tooth? Nobody knows. The, the number's not there. If you open a flap, we have those numbers. They're mm. between two and four millimeters, 2.4, two to four, 4.4. If you don't open a flap, those numbers are first coming in at, at about a millimeter. So with nothing in there, no graft, no provisional, just extraction and nothing in there, we see on average, it could be half a millimeter thick, thicker bone, it could be 1.5, mm -hmm. but the average is about a millimeter, not four, and that's a big difference. Yes, that's amazing. When you don't open a flap, and so then you start—that's a big thing. The data is really overwhelming. Yeah, and then again, you start taking that and adding the graft, adding the provisional, and you're seeing right. zero. We are supporting it where it wants to be, where it was. We're not blanching the tissue at that point. When we're mm -hmm. doing the immediates, there was no blanching. We just put the tissue. We're just supporting it exactly where it was when you took the tooth out, and that's all the whole story is. You know, I think pr preparation for this procedure has kind of changed too. Joseph mm -hmm. Kahn published some amazing sagittal root projections with CTs, and mm -hmm. and it's amazing what you can kind of look at and say predictably, what am I going to look at when I extract this tooth as mm -hmm. far as buccal plate? Mm -hmm. And how right. that root angle kind of changes your surgical mind before you get in there. And that's been one of the advantages of CT. But we really don't know until we get in there and actually put a perio probe and measure from the free gingival down to the buccal plate and check for dehiscence. Check. You must. Yeah. And so that led you guys, uh, you and Dr. Chu, to establish this classification of sockets. Mm -hmm. And we, John and I first heard about this. We were like, man, this is amazing because now we can quantitatively 
actually put like a perio probe and say, hey, this is a class one, this right. is a class two, and then you right. subclassified class two sockets. To A, B, and C. Yeah, A, B, and C. And yeah. we heard um, Dr. Chu talk about at a meeting that um, you were trying out, this was a few years ago, you were trying out some 2C sockets with premolars. And yeah, because the, this whole the, let's maybe back up and just we say showed you know one the, yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So two A is of course when you've got the buckle the buckle plate intact, right? Mm -hmm. right. And then as you as you it's start, the, to, it's just a little bit resorbed. Yeah, three to right. five millimeters, right? right. But right. your but your two C mm -hmm. socket, yeah, your two C socket, is you're, gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So so how mm -hmm. far can we push the dual zone concept into those? That's what those we're areas? learning right now. But believe it or not, we can push the dual zone concept with a membrane, a proper membrane, put it in a rigid membrane that doesn't just disappear. It has to be when it gets wet, it can't. Be like BioGuide, which is a great membrane, but it's that's for draping over something. Mm. But here I want something rigid enough that when it goes in, it doesn't uh, lose its uh, doesn't rigidity. Collapse. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's usually four to six months in, before it will resorb. So we're placing those kind of membranes in, and therefore we are blocking the fibrous tissue from that free gingiva. So the size is not as critical as we once thought, as mm. long as it's big enough to cover the whole gap. Okay. Mm. Obviously, the narrower it is, and uh, Joe Kahn uh, published a wonderful paper. He's a good friend and does so much good work on this. Joe Kahn published a paper with um, different um, uh, V shape, U shape, mm. and W real wide. And he showed that the amount of recession was greatest when he had a real wide one. Mm. But that's without the same techniques that we're doing. Mm -hmm. He just showed that in general when he did this work, after he looked at the width, when he opened it up, the real wide ones were a problem, the biggest problem in terms of recession, mm -hmm. all right? And the narrow V-shaped ones hardly had uh, much recession at all. Yeah. And so there was V-shaped, very narrow, U-shaped, and then what he calls W or wide, two, like two, two U's. And the bigger and wider it is, the more recession you have. But that's not with our technique. That's with just extraction and then placing grafts and doing nothing and placing implants. So, and he placed the implants, many of them were too far to the buckle, and if you look at that article, some of his incision designs were in, in a place where it wouldn't be great, wouldn't be perfect. So we have to relook at that, and that's part of what we're doing right now. We're doing enough of these um, type two defects immediately um, to see whether or not we're seeing the recession. Amazingly, we are not seeing much at all. Hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. we are, like we showed, uh, we published the article with 10 consecutive cases by Dr. Sanicaro and ourselves, uh, our, my partner, Dr. Chu and myself, uh, and Guido Sanicaro. And we, these were all by cuspids, non-aestheticsome. So we were testing the hypothesis. He was doing it a little bit behind my back in the office, as I mentioned <laughs> yesterday, because nice. I'm usually anti-placing an implant where there's no buckle plate all these years. But as you see, we're evolving. We're changing as we're learning, but it has a biologic rationale. Mm. So we said, why not combine the ice cream cone technique with the immediate that we're doing? And it made sense. And the question is, cosmetically, did it hold up? And believe it or not, they are holding up. So, so, so at this point, we, we may not be able to say we can do it on, uh, maybe this isn't ready for prime time, but it's essentially the research is being done. Right. These papers are going to be coming out. We may be able to push this all the way to a absent buckle plate. Right. Right now, some of the bicuspids that we showed had huge abscess there's no buckle plate at all, and they all worked. Mm. And the implants are going to take us to be in the bicuspid. We go into the pallet root. But the question is, cosmetically, did we hold the tissue out where the buckle plate, the buckle wall of the buckle root was gone? And the answer right now is yes. Mm. We maintained it. Uh, we maintained it three millimeters of bone, radiographic bone at least, uh, uh, at six months with the CAT scan on the buckle of the implant. That's tremendous. That is right. tremendous. Three millimeters of buckle wall. But that's a bicuspid. You got a big right. gap. Right. Right. So, so now, I want to. So I want to go. Uh, since we know, if we if we feel comfortable, and that's been published already, and that's been published already, that three right. millimeters. Yes, that's amazing. So if mm -hmm. we feel comfortable with, I mean, let's 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 say, okay, that's that's pushing it to maybe a, a more extreme situation. But if we feel comfortable with the typical two A type of situation, mm -hmm. um, and we know that this concept has been published, it's been proven. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because there are so many other approaches that people are taking, and, and it's a bit controversial. It seems like no one can agree as to what is the best way to manage immediate implants. And, you know, we had an interesting discussion that came up during the AO meeting this last year. We talked about this before the show with, with very different opinions about this idea, and it all seemed to come back more to can we place an implant microgap below the crest uh, safely? Uh, will it eventually result in bone loss? Or, uh, you know, we had the other viewpoint uh, saying we should we should use a, a, a polished collar implant that was placed. A, a bone level implant. But bone I level mean, a tissue, a tissue level tissue, versus yeah. bone level. Yeah, mm -hmm. so what? So why is this so controversial? Why is this, uh, why is this concept there? To me, it's not controversial at all on the, in the front of the mouth. 
You're not going to use the tissue level implant in the front of the mouth. That's what you know, great clinicians like Boozer and Belzer were doing before they had the bone level implant. Strauman is a great implant, but they, before they had the bone level implant, they only had the tissue level implant. So that's all the, the people who are using Strauman only use that, and they use it in the back of the mouth, which is fine, but they then use it in the front of the mouth. The problem is that when you use it in the front of the mouth, you have a problem of where you place the top of the head of the implant for aesthetics. Once you're in the aesthetic zone on a high smile, you've got to place it deeper. You have to place that implant top at the, about the buccal crest, no matter what implant you're using, in order to have proper aesthetics, to give you about three millimeters of tissue to be able to create a nice, smooth, beautiful emergence profile. Like there's the reason why those cases we showed you yesterday and what we do look so good, I think they look good because we had enough running room to create the contour that we need. Yes. So I'm not gonna place them any shallower than three millimeters below the height of the buckle for each gingiva. Knowing that, what happens? If you have a tissue level implant, you are now placing it below the crest, below, you're placing it um, uh, with a polished collar, the top part of the tissue level is polished. It's 2.8 millimeters. You place that, or you can make the aesthetic plus 1.8, but you're placing that below the, the buccal crest. And in doing so, anything polished, the bone will not stay on. Mm -hmm. So the bone, if you look at all the original work that Boozer and Belzer did, and there's nobody finer than the two of them ever, surgically or restoratively, but if you look at all their cases, you see the bone going right up to the interface between the rough and the polished border. Sure. So they lost all that bone, and that's why they had to realize that they had to come out with the bone level implant, and that's when they did. That's when Strauman switched also, okay, we make a bone level, and that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's what makes sense. Now here's the, here's the fallacy of it all. In the front of the mouth, not the back, but in the front of the mouth, because of the average scallop of bone, and Frank's published a paper on this uh, years ago, beautiful paper, about the papilla preservation mm -hmm. and so on, uh, right, Frank? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> long time ago. Yeah. Long time ago. I published my paper on papilla even yeah. longer than that. Pon I believe yes, 1992. 1992. Yeah. Ponics versus implants? Uh, yeah, but the, it's real interesting. Mm -hmm. But the, the point is, there's this natural scallop of bone. And if you look at the work uh, in the front of the mouth, the bone has a normal scallop to it, just like the tissue does. And the tissue is about 4.5 millimeters, just like your article says. And the bone average is about 3 millimeter scallop. So if you're placing the implant, well, that's between two and four, the average is three. And uh, Olson did that work, and Oceanbine did that work, well established that we do, I mean, you know it. You know, see the bone sure. scallop on the sure. edge. Okay, so if we place the bone, I mean the implant, because of aesthetics, whatever implant it is, at the buccal crest bone, mm -hmm. we are going to be, every implant will be subcrestal interproximally. Of course. By about mm -hmm. two to four millimeters. Has to be. Right. So no matter which it is, every one of them for us in the aesthetic zone changes everything. Now, if you're talking about the posterior part of the mouth, the tissue level implant, in many respects, comes out smelling pretty well, mm -hmm. but not in the aesthetic zone. Aesthetic zone, it, it, it's a contrary, it's an implant that shouldn't be used in the aesthetic zone. Yeah, and we even heard that there was some contouring of bone going on to try to anticipate, try to anticipate that, this. that bone loss, mm -hmm. you know, and, the, and it seems like it's, uh, talk about technique sensitive. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, yeah, you don't want to, let, let nature do its own bone remodeling. It does a pretty right. good job on its own. Whenever you violate the biologic width, bone will remodel. Whenever yes. you do, so, and that combined with the texture of the bone, so the texture of the implant. So the, <laughs> the combination of where the micro gap is, yes. the bone will respond to where the micro gap is, the abutment connection for sure, combined with the uh, texture of the top of the implant. Mm. Initially, that's what determines where the bone's gonna go. Now, why did the original Branamuck implant go down to the first thread all the time, right? No matter what you did, the bone always kind of went down to the first thread. The good news, once it went down there, it stayed there. Mm. That's, that's reformation of the biologic width that has nothing at all to do with what? Uh, with trauma, occlusion, anything. Because the micro gap, was there, it was a butt joint, yes, but the micro gap acts as an irritant to the bone. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. bone doesn't like irritants, of course, so what does it do? It moves away. If it can't engulf the irritant, it moves away. About how far? About one and a half to two millimeters. And how far do you think the first thread is on the Brandenmark original implant? There you go. One and a half millimeters. Right, so essentially. And that's why we always see it three months afterwards, the radiograph goes down to about the first thread. So why do you Sorry. feel comfortable putting the micro gap below crest, knowing, mm -hmm. knowing that fact? What for aesthetics is the reason for that we aesthetics. do it. For aesthetics. Strictly, mm -hmm. we're doing it because of the scallop in the front of the mouth, and we're, every one of us are doing it to get an aesthetic outcome. The good news is that if you have a good, well-fitted implant, and you don't use cement that's lodged mm. into proximally, mm -hmm. and you use a custom, if you're using cement, you must use a custom abutment. Yes. In the front of the mouth, you have to have a scallop. You don't have a scalloped abutment, you're going to wind up having cement that you can't get off.
Because now picture what I just said, you got three millimeter scallop of bone and you place it at the crest. So your, your, your top of your implant is three millimeters below the average crest interproximally. And your papilla is another four to five millimeters from there. So from the base of the contact point to the top of your implant could be seven, seven and a half to eight millimeters. Mm -hmm. And that's impossible for you to clean unless you have a scalloped abutment where the top of your interface of your crown is now not as deep. And that's why you must have a scalloped abutment when you're doing anterior crowns. Not so a typical one millimeter classic uh, you know, right. abutment. Right, prefab, yeah. So I wonder if, you know, our protocols now have been driven surgically to account for these things and tissue thickness and are really connections better today with dental implants? Well, there's no question that the old external hex was the poorest fitted connection we had. That doesn't mean that they dislodged once you had a prop, after a while we realized that once you had the proper screw with the proper torque driver, external hexes still can be um, excellent. They can be screwed down with different screws now with torque. If you just use your hands, you can only generate, what, 10 to 15 Newton centimeters. Mm -hmm. That's when we used to see them loosen. And Dr. Paula Small and myself, we published a paper where we did a five-year study at, at school where we saw that uh, it was about 15% screw joint loosening in the posterior mandible with just hand torque. It was the original Branamark implants. Then what we did, and, and 3i, both, just typical external hex before we had torque drivers. Mm -hmm. Then once we had the torque drivers, we took the same bridges without changing the bridges and put a screw in and torqued them down to 25 to 32 Newton centimeters torque. And not one of them came loose afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. That's right. Amazing. So it's a matter of pre-torque and pre-load, and that's the key. Now in Europe, a lot of people, even though they're offered internal connections, don't want them. They like the external connection. They grew up with it. Mm -hmm. So the companies tell me that they're still making it because mm -hmm. there's a big need for it to, for sales that especially in Europe, and that's because if you have an external hex that's only seven tenths of a millimeter high, you know, sticking up from the top, the parallelism is easier, mm -hmm. and they do it, as opposed to putting a, a uni abutment or some kind of abutment that uh, has, allows different angles to be used, and so mm -hmm. that's how they're working it. Now, if we're placing these subcrestal, or we're, we're thinking about dual zone, does the connection become more important in terms of maintaining, you know, bacterial, uh, a bacterial seal? Is micro-movement really a big deal? They all leak. Okay. That's what I wanted to hear you yeah, say. Yeah, they, they all, all leak. leak. Yeah, yeah. There's so many papers that show that there is leakage, just a matter of amount, amount. That doesn't mean that they're, they're bad connections. That doesn't mean that they come loose. Don't confuse the two. But with micro motion, the two parts move. Now, Paul Weigel did that original work online where he showed that the butt joint, you know, he says beautiful radiograph showing with the butt joint with pressure. You see it opening and pumping and everything mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Then he shows a, um, the implant with an internal connection. You don't see that. You don't see any, you don't see it opening up, but you can't look from the side. Mm. Right. You're only and looking in one dimension. I said, no, what do you have to look for, for an internal connection? You've got to look down. From the top. So I told Paul, I said, listen, take off the, the top part of it when, before you do it so you can look down. Ah. And sure, en sure enough, he saw the motion. Has that been published? Did he publish that? No. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. And, and I'm all over him on this and he's a good friend. And we've been talking about this for 10 years because he has this big radiographic study online that you can go because it's company driven. Yeah, because Ziprich, everybody throws Zipprich that up there, right? Zipprich everybody Zipprich throws that up and Zipprich they show... work with Paul Weigel, right? Zipprich okay, so Weigel. there is some studies that talk about so this. <laughs> understand that there is no such thing as no micro motion. Right. When I say that six times, there's no <laughs> there's such thing as no mic. Now, it doesn't mean they're bad connections. They're great connections. They don't come loose. They're fine. Yeah. So don't misunderstand too. But do they move? Any two parts will move. Yeah. Period. And to say that there's no <clears throat> micro motion is really sinful because the, all every engineer knows that any two parts will have some micro motion between them, even if it doesn't dislodge. You it's say it's will. sinful. I like that. It is because it's a disruption of the thought process of making people think that there's no micro motion. Yes, it's a sales tactic. It's just relative, but it is. It is. It's, oh, their implant may be better, may have less micro motion, but they all have micro so motion. What, so what does matter about implant design? What matters is the top of the implant long term. Initially, it matters a little bit where the polished collar is. If wherever you have a polished collar, you're going to lose bone. If it's polished, not machined, but polished, bone will not accept it. If I put in, if I put in a polished collar, that's like the ITI implant, like I said, with a 2.8 millimeter collar, and I submerge it to the crest, that's a tissue level implant, the bone will go right down to the rough surface. Mm -hmm. So it's not titanium that's needed to integrate. You need a texture plus a surface that can integrate. So what is integration? It's not really even touching the implant. 
on the light microscope level, yeah, the bone looks like it's touching the implant. On the, light, on the electron microscope level, there's actually a space between the implant and the bone filled by a glycoprotein material. So it's about 100 angstrom units, but it's filled that you don't see it on the light microscope level, and there's no fibrous tissue in between, so there's no mobility. But there actually is no contact. It's really the titanium, forms an immediate oxide, like you all know, and the oxide interacts with the bone through this glycoprotein like chondroitin sulfate, hyaluronic acid, and that's what interacts with the bone. So there is no direct contact on the electron microscope level. Mm. And so when you have titanium, oh, people say, well, it's titanium, it's gonna integrate. No, if it's polished titanium and you put it in the same way, you'll take it right out. Where do we see that? If your TADs, for example, are made of titanium and you place them in, uh, uh, or uh, um, place them in, if they're electro-polished, highly polished, they'll give you initial stability, but it's come six months later, what can you do? The reverse mm -hmm. talk, mm -hmm. come right out. How about your bone screws for your block grafts that surgeons use? They're electro-polished. The people know, because if you had a textured one, you wouldn't be able to get them out, mm -hmm. right? That's right. That's it, so it's all biology. It's all mm -hmm. understanding wound healing. So can gold integrate? Could gold integrate? Sure, by that same Right, idea, if it's right? not toxic, and it has the, but not polished. If it has the same machine surface with its roughness in it or texture, it will. And uh, Abramson showed that work as far back as almost 15 years ago using uh, titanium and gold implants and showed that you can actually have gold to integrate. So integration, but polished collars will never integrate. Polished surfaces won't. So the first rule is make sure the polished collar, you're in a double-ended sword. I'd like to have a polished collar at the top I don't want it because the bone will not attach to it. So I'm gonna lose bone right away. But what's the possible positive? The possible positive is resistance to peri-implantitis down the road, which mm -hmm. we didn't talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. So the top of an implant is always a, a give and take. I want something that will not lose bone, but hopefully if it gets exposed, uh, will not become a periodontal nightmare and a track plaque. Yeah, mm. well, and so that's again, it's your caught in a catch-22. Yeah, you, you, you do right. one and you kind of lose something else. So in, another, way you go. in 1993, I came up, unfortunately I published it in one of these throwaway journals, but it's out there, uh, the concept of a hybrid implant. Mm -hmm. And I published that in, as early as 1993 because I was initially only using Branamark implants in the 80s. I started in 82 and uh, taught, got taught by Branamark and George Zob up in Toronto. And we only used machined implants at myself in my office and at school. And we really didn't see peri-implantitis. Now, the granted, these were full-arch cases, not partially dentalism, but to be honest with you, I didn't see any peri-implantitis of any significance. It might have had a little mucositis, a little gingival irritation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the bone was basically whatever I got if the implants took. I mean, peri-implantitis was not a big factor. Mm -hmm. Then all the rough surfaces came in, and they were better in softer bone. So we saw switched over for sinus grafting and everything. Our own study at, when I was at NYU, we showed with, that, with, with Dr. Wallace and uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Fromm and, uh, and Dr. Cho, we showed without question that with machine surface implants only had about a 75 to 80% success rate with our students and with us teaching, even with ourselves. But when we did all the textured implants, TPS coded, SLA, anything like that, um, a tile bus, any of those rough ones, we had a 95% success rate. So mm -hmm. we went from 75 to 95% success rate. So people said, whew, soft bone, you know, not anterior yeah. mandible, but yeah. soft mm -hmm. bone, it made a difference. So everybody, of course, switched to textured implants, which is what we're using today. But please understand that there's a double-ended sword. There's such a thing as too rough mm. at the top. And so, of course, roughness is good for integration. Why is roughness, why is it not just the metal? Why is it roughness? Because integration is mechanical. Mm. Mm -hmm. And people don't get that. That's why the polished collar doesn't integrate. That's why you can back it out. Machined is not polished. It still has rough little grooves left behind in where the machine, where the threads were made. So it's not a highly polished surface, but it's pretty, pretty smooth, but not completely smooth. Not like an abutment would be, a healing abutment, that's smooth. Um, Transepithelial abutment, that's smooth. But the implant itself, a machined implant, has uh, little leftover striations left over in the threads, and that's why integration did take place, in the, but it takes slower. It's slower. So that's, that's you know, John, we've heard some research on some implant companies that are looking at their surface texture. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, too mm -hmm. rough, not good. Right. Just the right amount. And the quality of the etching or the sandblasting or whatever mm -hmm. they're or the doing to their surface. Or, yeah, no. yeah. What? Speak to that. Like some of the, the nooks and crannies. I mean, we <laughs> see these giant, right. you know, threads and how do you properly 
you know, sandblast or whatever treatment you're applying. That's great. Yeah. What's great questions you're asking. Great questions you're asking. There's a reason that, you know, the original rough surface implant was TPS, titanium mm -hmm. plasma spray. The RA value, which is the roughness value of, R, of, uh, of TPS, uh, let's put it this way, machined or something polished, RA value represents the, the these are the, is the valley between the two peaks, okay? So there's how wide are my peaks and how deep are my valleys. Roughness, when you say something is smooth, it basically has no big bumps in it, mm -hmm. like this table. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going up and down. It feels pretty smooth when I go across it. Here I would hit a bump and go down. So the RA value, some people use SA, but the word S with a little a, the RA or SA value, which is really the key to, the first key to roughness, is the vertical distance, uh, the average vertical distance that you see between two peaks. A smooth one would be less than 0 0.5 microns, like your abutments that are smooth, that you say, mm -hmm. oh, it's a smooth abutment to your look and to your texture. The machine surface is about over 0.5. It's about 0 0.7, 0 0.7 RA. If you go to... Um, most of the SLA and most of the surfaces like Tile Blast mm -hmm. and most of the other surfaces that we do today, they're in the one to two range, one, one about one and a half uh, microns in the valleys, okay, to the depth, average depth. TPS was over, was over two, it was two and a half to three. So it was almost too rough. Mm -hmm. So it was great to allow bone to integrate, which was wonderful, yes? Mm -hmm. But the problem is if it got exposed, Mm. Uh, Bad. Yeah, not cleansable. Hello. Yeah, the plaque would just love it. Yeah. So the texture represents something which is uh, very important for any rough surface will integrate. Any rough surface will integrate. Period. However, if it gets exposed, then it depends on the shape and depth of those valleys that make a difference. Not just the depth, but also the shape. There are some surfaces that are that have uh, cave-like openings. Uh, Tyunite is one of them, mm -hmm. and where you, it's an increased oxide layer. It's not blasted. And so you have a situation where you have almost a cave-like opening. Mm -hmm. And so the bacteria can, get once they're in there, almost impossible to yeah. easily get And there were some problems with that. Yes. Right? There well, was, there's problems yeah. with it. And they, they, you know, this is a big discussion I've had with them many, many times. They don't even want to know how many times I've had it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's quite significant. I think if you look at Berglund's work, and I'm talking about quoting literature, you're talking about uh, all the animal studies, and there have been a few of them done by different universities, show that if all the rough surfaces got exposed, to plaque by, by, let's say, ligatures in the animal, and then take the ligatures off and then watch the progression of the breakdown, the tyunite surface broke down about twice as fast as the other rough surfaces. So I just have to ask, because I think we're, we're really on this, on this borderline of this topic, is um, I know it, it would, could be a whole other show, but do you, you mentioned that you know, before these roughened surfaces were available that you weren't seeing a lot of periimplantitis. It was mucositis. Right. So, That's the fully machined implant. Yeah, mm -hmm. fully machined, but it's so controversial. You know, there's discussion about was it the cements that we were using then? You know, Wadwani's whole deal with, with sure. the reactivity of cements. It was it the parts, uh, the machining capability. You sounds like you feel like the rough and surface is the big the change. Cement will certainly cause the initial irritation. You know, if you put cement down there, it's like any other irritant, mm -hmm. like even on a crown, on teeth, you put cement and leave it there. It's a rough surface. Bacteria will be there and will irritate the gums. But that's a localized irritation. But once it gets started. Mm -hmm. Will it progress at a fast rate? Okay. That's the key. Okay. So cement, don't, there are two different things. One is the cement would act as a nidus to start the inflammation, uh, just like a bad-fitting crown. You know, it's a major irritant for plaque or plaque trap. But then the question is, will the progression go faster? Mm. Now, if you look at a work by, there's a reason why Strauman switched over from TPS after initial work from the 70s when they started with Schroeder and, and, and Boozer and so on, they started in TPS coating. And then uh, around... Uh, the year 2000, they switched over to SLA. Why? They were very successful then. They were very successful, but they started to see that there was a bit of a problem. And the problem was, you look at an article by Benneke, B-E-H-N-K-E, and Benneke did a, a five-year longitudinal study on, and was an ITI user. It wasn't like somebody tried to go after them or mm -hmm. anything like that. ITI user. And Benneke basically... Um, uh, showed after five years, they showed they did the TPS, they did the original TPS implant, mm -hmm. and they showed that at five years, 11% of the implants had greater than four millimeters bone loss mm -hmm. in their controlled study, with five-year longitudinal study, and it, it progressed. At one year, <coughs> at one year it was only two percent. Five years it was five percent. At 
I mean, in three years, it was 5%. At, at five years, it was 11%. Wow. Wow. So the progression was going down, and they even say in the article, this is, seems to be, uh, we can't resolve it. It's going downhill, and we're not sure. So I kept asking Strom people, Why, you know, what's the problem here? You, how do you account for Beneke's article? Longitudinal study, every implant documented for five years. And they said, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. And to their credit, they changed. That's when they said, let's go to SLA. We were looking at it. They were looking at it. They said, let's go to SLA. It's a little, it's rough, but it's not as rough. Okay. Mm. And that's why they switched. And they did it professionally. They did it properly. Now, now, you know, um, uh, Ty and I, the Nobel people, they, they just try to squash everything. Anybody that comes up with anything, they'll come up with any issues they can to say, this just doesn't exist. Uh, we have great results. But don't, comp don't, don't compare survival with... Um, with uh, success. Yes. yes. And that's the difference. Survival just means the implant's integrated. But you can lose nine, seven, eight, nine millimeters and it's surviving because the apex is still there, but it doesn't mean it's a happy implant. <laughs> right. So I think right. that gives you my summation on that. That's a pretty good summation, John. Yes. I think that what I, well, first of all, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, we to could, Sorry for speaking quickly. No, 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 no listen. Beautiful. I am just drinking in the yes. knowledge. Yes, <laughs> this and is good. Like we could sit here all day long yes, and chat excellent. about these things. There's a million things to talk about with you because, again, you are. We. I just want to tell you, we practice mm -hmm. um, your methods mm -hmm. to the T. We teach oh, your good. methods to the T, and they work. It's T for Tana, right? Yes, <laughs> yes, T for Tarnow, right. and we'll talk kidding. about you later, but, um, <laughs> but honestly, we live and see the results on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we uh, read the literature, and we know that you're on the forefront of even greater things, and so we really appreciate what you've done for the dental uh, industry, and if there's ever an opportunity for us to uh, have you back on yeah, to talk this more. Conversation. That's great. We're sure. always at the AO, and we love to hear you there. Sure. And uh, appreciate what you're doing for well, education as well. Your questions are great, and thank you for being so supportive. Thank you so much. Really appreciate Absolutely. it, guys. Well, guys. Thank you, Frank, for doing <clears throat> Thanks, Denny. Yeah. Sure. Always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's appropriate for you to do all the topic uh, talking on this. <laughs> well, topic, we talked so. about that before. <laughs> no, no. Hey, I did, you, you got him, yeah, well, Dennis Tarnow sitting here? I did quote your, did quote your article a couple of times. Which, Come on. Yeah, he got a couple quotes in. That was good. He got a couple quotes in. Well, it's been another great time we've got to spend with you guys, our listeners. We know you've enjoyed this conversation. Um, give us your feedback. Give us your questions. This will be something that, you know, as it gets released, um, there's going to be a lot of good comments and feedback that are going to come from, from this one. And, Wes, it's been a, another good day at yeah. Spear Summit. <laughs> yes. uh, we're, we're grateful to Spear for uh, everything they've done to bring us to be a part of this. So for, uh, for us today, for Dr. Tarnow, Dr. Spear, for Wes, I'm John. It's been great. Well, Wes, you know, there's, there's a lot of meat in that interview. I mean, that was definitely one of the most epic interviews I think we've ever done in terms of just content and in such a short time. I mean, I learned a lot from that from Dr. I, Tarnow in and things things that I didn't even really appreciate until just that moment as he's just like bringing this to us. I mean, Wes, tell what did you what were some of the takeaways that you got from this? So, you know, there's this the content you know, he says at the end of this, he's like, I hope I didn't go too fast or speak too fast. He didn't speak too fast. It's just that everything he said had substance to it. Yes. And I actually stopped and rewound and listened to segments of the show multiple times to really grasp what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you the engineering mind mm -hmm. and the biological truly you could see kind of come out in this. And that that's that's the thing I took from this, John. Yeah. And really at recent RDI session, I, and I brought this up in series one, is that it's not just the mechanical, it's understanding the biological. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing here is you're asking something that's mechanical to act with in conjunction with biology. And right. man, here, here you have someone, I told you this earlier today, that, and maybe I was telling my wife about it, but that has so much experience, you cannot disregard what he knew from the days of beginning of dental implants mm -hmm. and what he knows now and how he puts that together. This is why he can engineer new dental right. implants is because right. he knows what what and, you know, engineering and I think, does. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think what I also got from it, because it's been something that's been kind of near and dear to me, has been just the, you know, the the controversies that we talked about from the AO recap, yes. you know, about uh, this whole idea about whether uh, you can place the microgap subcrestally and, you know, wh whether we should, uh, whether, whether biology, uh, whether we can overcome some of the limitations of biology with some of the techniques that, that he and Dr. Chu have introduced. And, and I think it really helped me to understand that even some of our ways of thinking about external hex, you know, he kind of challenged some of that about whether external mm -hmm. hex was even good enough, you know, whether, whether the, mm -hmm. the micro gap, how much it even really does matter. And I think it just goes back to confirming a lot of what we've talked about with placement being everything and understanding of biology being everything. Uh, that was something that he kind of kept coming back to every single time was basic science, basic biology, basic engineering, uh, and, and yet was able to connect that to the clinical setting backed up by the literature. I mean, it's the whole package. It's the thing that we're going for all the time when we talk about things on our show. So Wes, it's I mean, what, a, what an amazing It's definitely next level interview. for series four. Oh, Next, next level for series four, or not yeah. series four, for se <laughs> for season uh, four, se seasons four. Yeah, it's next level. It is next level for stuff, sure. and we're glad to bring it to you guys. Hey, give us some feedback on this, you know. Yep. Now, and thanks to Spear. One thing. thing I will give yes, one piece that. of credit because they gave us this opportunity. They were the ones that paved the way. Not yep. only Doctor Spear himself, but Spear Education in general. Could have done it Thank without you him. for to all that were involved in making that interview possible and making that successful. Uh, it's a huge, huge thing for us. Well, I'll tell you what, um, we'll never forget it. And we mm -hmm. appreciate them and Spear Education. If you're interested in great education, head to Spear Education mm -hmm. and uh, take some course or something. Hey, sign yeah. up for Spear, yeah. Spear Online. You're not going to be disappointed. You know? You're not going to be disappointed um, with what you get there at Spear Education. Hey, so... For the next five minutes, I want to talk about this article that we found in Jomi uh, this past month. And uh, we're not going to talk about it long, but we're going to talk about it because we love Geek's Corner. Exactly. And this is what we do, guys. This is the dental guys. Um, this is what we do for you is we bring you some stuff that really, if you're placing dental implants, and even if you're not. Right. You know, what is the deal the first time that you're drilling an osteotomy and you perf in to the sinus or you just, you're drilling and you hit that cortical plate and you're like, I just need another half millimeter. And then all of a sudden, oh, my right. 2 right. just dropped into a massive hole. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, I just went into the sinus. Now I've got to do Codwell luck. And I'm thinking, right. oh man, but you know what? You're thinking, right? you're thinking bad day. But honestly, it's not that bad because when you learn about dental implants and how to do intrasinus bone gain with an osteotome technique, there's really not much to worry about about that, okay? Because right. here's the interesting thing is that for years, we thought to gain bone above a dental implant and let's say this particular article is talking about ridges of six millimeters or more let's say that we wanted to gain three to four to five millimeters of bone that we need to do a lateral window well here comes along a guy okay that um tatum who mm -hmm. coined the term it was an osteotome technique that was first introduced by him where you would finish the osteotomy a millimeter or so below the sinus, okay? You don't perf the sinus. You finish it a millimeter before. And then what you do is you start working up the size of that osteotomy, and then you're going to pack a little bone and then up fracture mm -hmm. with an osteotome and maybe a mallet, okay, the sinus to lift the membrane and balloon out the membrane with the bone and the fractured piece of cortical plate. That's up against the sinus. Then you place your implant up into the up into the up fractured area in around the bone graft and the side heals, and that basically is the technique. Now you can look that up. We'll put a link in the description to Tatum's technique and uh, this article. So there were some questions about this technique, you know, and and how much could you gain? First of all, how much bone gain could you expect? And then mm -hmm. also, 
um, how important was the graft? Would the bone fill in around your implant, even if you didn't have bone graft material in there by just lifting the membrane right. up? And that's really what this study uh, w was trying to answer. It was essentially a review of the literature, looking at different techniques, whether you grafted or whether you did not With graft. or without use of bone. Right. right. And you so just the question want, is, it, if you just put the implant up there, you know, yeah. do, do, is it good enough or do you need grafting material? And if so, how much and how important is it depending upon the thickness of your remaining bone height? And, right. So, John, I think I sent you an up fracture that I did um, back um, maybe uh, maybe a month or so ago. And actually, you know what we'll do is I'll mark this time in the video. And if you're if you're on the video right now and you see this, this essentially is a CT of an up fracture that I did. And you see the up fracture and the actual piece of fractured cortical plate and what was accomplished there with that. And mm -hmm. do, I didn't pack any bone in there. Okay, right. so interesting thing is, is that I had done this procedure and hadn't read this article because I had read articles that had supported not grafting. Mm -hmm. And so I don't advocate grafting in these in these uplift procedures, these sinus bumps per se. Okay, and so this this to me is a great review if you're if you're wanting to know a little bit about, hey, does it matter about the bone that you put up in there? Do you need to put some kind of special bone? Do you need to put bile loss, something that is not as not to as hold volume, you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, to hold volume. Do you need to use 50-50? Do you need to use cortical? Here's, here's the thing, is that the research says you don't need to put bone in these uplift procedures. And, John, tell, tell us a little bit about, too, what can you expect as far as, hey, this is how much virgin bone I have now. How much can I actually attain? What did this, right. what did the research say on that? Yeah, and that was a good that was a I, one of the good takeaways from this. And again, you know, we don't want to just make this just for surgeons and have you guys shut off if you're not placing implants. You know, it's also important for the restorative docs to know if you're not doing surgery what you can expect from your surgeon. You're looking at a PA or you're looking at a CT or you're looking at a panoramic and, and you're trying to gauge, you know. Can we place implants here with a summers or internal type of list or lift, or do we need to do a lateral window, which increases the cost for your patient a lot, even if you're not doing it? So what we found, what they found, is that if you had four to five millimeters of remaining bone height from the crest to the sinus, that you could expect somewhere around two to three millimeters of bone gain, and that was regardless of whether or not you placed a graft. So that would mm -hmm. mean that you could get an eight millimeter implant in even if you only had um, a, a very small amount of, of residual bone height. Uh, so if you had four to five millimeters of bone height, expect around two to three millimeters of gain. If you had six to seven millimeters of residual bone height, you could expect that you would end up with, again, three millimeters or four even of gain. So you could expect to place a 10 to 12 millimeter length implant in pretty predictably. So this helps you to know if you're starting off and you're wondering, well, how much gain am I going to get? Now, there was a slight, to be fair, there was a slight difference of one millimeter or less if you did use bone, right. maybe a little bit more gain. But you know what we understand too is with implant length, as we've talked a lot about, maybe not mattering as much as we used to think, um, as long as you're getting a decent sized implant there, that extra one millimeter may not matter for you. And I definitely think that it makes things much easier knowing you don't have to worry about graph material, knowing that it's not as important certainly makes things much more simple. You're not worrying too about if you do have a small perforation in the membrane, getting graph material into the sinus. You know, if you're not right. using a bunch of it, you don't have to worry about this big balloon of material that you're putting in there without even realizing until you take your post-op uh, radiograph. So that, that really, One to me, Wes, thing I want to help me out a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. And I'll tell you something here is that you can, you can really rely on this because most of these studies that they used to develop this uh, opinion were tracked at uh, up to five years. One of them was actually went out to 10 years and was still maintaining um, uh, bone height, intraosseous bone height. And so you know, my thoughts on this are, are yeah, this is really great. Um, what, I, what we don't know, though, this is one thing we need to research, is we don't know 
in ridges less than six millimeters, okay, these are all ridges greater than six millimeters in height. With the advent of short implants, let's say we have a ridge that is five millimeters mm -hmm. and we're going to put a six millimeter implant in, okay? Or let's say our ridge is, let's take it down even more. Let's say our ridge is four millimeters and we're going to put like a five, five or a six millimeter implant in. Now that's not much lift, but there's not a lot of research yet done on a lift in a, in a residual ridge that is less than six millimeters. Right. So keep An that internal, in mind. Internal lift. Yes, yeah, internal yeah. lift. Now, we're not yeah. talking about lateral size. We're talking about internal lifts here. So right. keep that in mind when doing bumps, that when you're using short implants, we're already asking a lot of shorts, okay? We're already asking a lot of shorts. We don't want to maybe ask even more, okay? Mm -hmm. So be careful. So use caution okay. and keep use looking caution. at the literature here. Yep. Because that's ongoing right now is is trying to see if we can avoid lateral grafting. You know, if we have a three millimeter yep. residual ridge height, can we get away with a, a six millimeter implant and do a bump, mm -hmm. uh, or do we need to do lateral window? You know, how much how much native bone do you really need with a shorter implant? Uh, is it really that important? So that's something we look forward to seeing more about. Wes, I think this is a a great this article, and if again you can check this out if you want. Uh, in this month's ep in this uh, October uh, edition of the International Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Implants, which is a quintessence journal. So if you're not currently yep. subscribed to that journal, we would highly recommend if you're doing a lot of implant dentistry or doing almost any implant dentistry that you check it out. It's one of our must reads. We definitely have uh, found that it really has changed the way we practice. Um, Wes, man, what a show. Season four. I mean, we started Season it four. off Here we go. with a, a bang, really, with Dr. Tarnow. Um, we, we really, he changed a lot of, of what we thought, uh, we, we could get out of a single interview. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. to, to learn as much as we did and, and then to, to kind of follow that up with, with one of our signatures, man, the geeks corner. It's a great yeah, way to start podcast off season four. first for the dental guys is uh, Dennis Tarnow. I don't think he's ever been on another podcast. I yeah. Don't think We're so. feeling good. Feeling, yeah, feeling good. pretty good about that. Super stoked. Hey All right, guys, Wes, if bring us somebody, home. if there's somebody out there that you want us to interview or some article you want us to talk about, if there's some controversial thing that you are being challenged about in your practice, is there something in school that a professor said and you're like, hey, I want to know more about that, or hey, guys, what articles do you recommend me read for this? If there's some procedure that we haven't talked about, hey, look, we're here to kind of look out for you guys and look out for our practice too and our patients. That's what the Dental Guys is all about. It's all about taking things to the next level. It's about clinical excellence, and we want you to help support us. And how can you do that? You can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. You can hit us up on Instagram. You can go over and start watching our YouTube videos. Hey, listen, there's going to be some great things to come. And with the Dental Guys, we are super excited about bringing high-quality contact content helping you take your practice and our practice to the next level we want to do more of this because of the feedback that you send us so we want to hear from you we want you to message us tell us what you think give us a review hey we need you to go out there on itunes and apple podcast and give us a review get leave us a five-star review leave us a review on facebook five stars we need you to tell us what you like about the dental guys send us topics this has been another great episode, and we look forward to more this season on The Dental Guys. For John, I'm Wes, and we are The Dental Guys.